The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 29 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the um, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, it's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, But yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. All right, it is nine o'clock. Let us look at the next episode, shall we not? Uh, where we got to, as you might might have some idea, based on the strap line that I've created for this one, where, of course, at the end of last week, we have found out the shock news that Infinidim Enterprises is actually, is actually the Vogons. <gasps> Belgium, man, Belgium. What is going on in the universe if the Vogons are running the guide? Shocking. So that's where we got to, um, and, and we are now ready to go even further. Um, and just to say, of course, those that are just joined, please do go to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and become a patron. I really, really, really would be so happy if you would. It's only five dollars a month minimum. That's it. Uh, so if you would be so kind to do that, I would be immensely grateful and be able to buy food. Anyway, right. Chapter. Oh, uh, you see now, you gotta, you gotta like Douglas Adams style because I've just looked here. We've got to this the point where uh, we finished off with. Actually, the guide now says panic on it rather than don't panic, because it finally the penny dropped with Ford that it was Vogons that are right now running the guide. And the next chapter is chapter thirteen. <gasps> Spooky. Ooh. All right, enough of that. Okay, chapter thirteen. Oh no, as usual. Cheers, people. Whatever you're slurping, I've got tea again. And this is where I get very English. I do love tea. Oh, I do love tea. Oh, God. Yum. Right, then. Let us start. 
The ship dropped quietly to land on the edge of the wide clearing, a hundred yards or so from the village. It arrived suddenly and unexpectedly, but with a minimum of fuss. One moment it was perfectly ordinary late afternoon in the early autumn. The leaves were just beginning to turn red and gold, the river was beginning to swell again with the rains from the mountains in the north, the plumage of the peaker birds was beginning to thicken in uh, to was beginning to thicken in anticipation of the coming winter frosts. Any day now, the perfectly normal beasts would start their thunderous migration across the plains. An old thrash barg was beginning to mutter to himself as he hobbled this way, his, his way around the village, a muttering which meant that he was rehearsing and elaborating the stories that he would tell of the past year once the evenings had drawn in and people had no choice but to gather round the fire and listen to him and grumble and say that that wasn't how they remembered it and the next moment there was a spaceship sitting there gleaming in the warm autumn sun. It hummed for a bit and then stopped. It wasn't a big spaceship, if the villagers had been experts on spaceships, they would have known at once that it was a pretty nifty one, a small, sleek, hurundi four-berth runabout with just about every optional extra in the brochure except advanced vectiloid stabilis <laughs> my god, advanced vectoid stabilisis, which only wimps went for. You can't get a good tight, sharp curve around a trilateral time axis with an advanced vectoid stabilisis. That, all right, it's a bit safer, but it makes the handling go all soggy. The villagers didn't know all that, of course. Most of them here on the remote planet of Lamuella had never seen a spaceship, certainly not one that was all in one piece, as it shone warmly in the evening light. It was just the most extraordinary thing they had come across since the day Kerp caught a fish with a head at both ends. Everybody had fallen silent. Whereas a moment before, or, uh, sorry, whereas a moment before, two or three dozen people had been wandering about, chattering, chopping wood, carrying water, teasing the picker birds, or just amiably trying to stay out of old Thrashbarg's way, suddenly all activity died away, and everybody turned to look at the strange object in amazement. Or, oh, not quite everybody. The picker birds tended to be amazed by completely different things. A perfectly ordinary leaf lying unexpectedly on a stone would cause them to skitter off in paroxysms of confusion. Sunrise took them completely by surprise every morning. But the arrival of an alien craft from another world simply failed to engage any part of their attention. They continued to car and writ and hook as they pecked for seeds on the ground. The river continued with its quiet, spacious burbling. Also, the noise of loud and tuneless singing from the last hut on the left continued unabated. Suddenly, with a slight click and a hum, a door folded itself outwards and downwards from the spaceship. Then, for a moment or two, nothing further seemed to happen, other than the loud singing from the last hut on the left, and the thing just sat there. Some of the villagers, particularly the boys, began to edge forward a little bit to have a closer look. Old Thrashbarg tried to shoo them back. This was exactly the sort of thing that old Thrashbarg didn't like to have happening. He hadn't foretold it, not even slightly, and even though he would be able to wrestle the whole thing into his continuing story somehow or other, it was really getting all a bit much to deal with. He strode forward, pushed the boys back, and raised his arms and his ancient knobbly staff into the air. The long, warm light of the evening sun caught him nicely. He prepared to welcome whatever gods these were, as if he had been expecting them all along. Still nothing happened. Gradually it became clear that there was some kind of argument going on inside the craft. 
time went by, and old Thrashbarg's arms were beginning to ache. Suddenly the ramp folded itself back up again. That made it easy for Thrashbarg. They were demons, and he had repulsed them. The reason he hadn't foretold it was that prudence and modesty forbade. Almost immediately a different ramp folded itself out on the other side of the craft from where Thrashbarg was standing, and two figures at last emerged on it, still arguing with each other and ignoring everybody, even Thrashbarg, whom they wouldn't have even noticed from where they were standing. Old Thrashbarg chewed angrily on his beard. To continue to stand there with his arms upraised, to kneel with his head bowed forward and his staff held out pointing at them, to fall backwards as if overcome in some titanic in inner struggle, perhaps just to go off to the woods and live in a tree for a year or two without speaking to anyone. He opted just to drop his arms smartly as if he had done what he meant to do. They were really hurting, so he didn't have much choice. He made a small secret sign he had just invented towards the ramp which had closed, and then made three and a half steps backwards, so that he could at least get a good look at whoever these people were, and then decide what to do next. The taller one was a very good-looking woman, wearing soft and crumply clothes. Old Thrashbarg didn't know this, but they were made of Rimplon, a new synthetic fabric which was terrific for space travel because it looked its absolute best when it was all creased and sweaty. The shorter one was a girl. She was awkward and sullen-looking, and was wearing clothes which looked their absolute worst when they were all creased and sweaty. And what was more, she almost certainly knew it. All eyes watched them, except for the picker birds, which had their own things to watch. The woman stood and looked around her. She had a purposeful air about her. There was obviously something in particular she wanted, but she didn't know exactly where to find it. She glanced from face to face among the villagers assembled curiously around her, without apparently seeing what it was she was looking for. Thrashbarg had no idea how to play this at all, and decided to resort to chanting. He threw back his head and began to wail, but was instantly interrupted by a fresh outbreak of song from the hut of the sandwich maker. The one on the left. The last one on the left. The woman looked around sharply, and gradually a smile came over her face. Without so much as a glance at old Thrashbarg, she started to walk towards the hut. There is an art to the business of making sandwiches, which it is given to few ever to find the time to explore in depth. It is a simple task, but the opportunities for satisfaction are many and profound. Choosing the right bread, for instance. The sandwich maker had spent many months in daily consultation and experiment with Grap the baker, and eventually they had, between them, created a loaf of exactly the consistency that was dense enough to slice thinly and neatly, while still being light moist, and having that fine nutty flavour which best enhanced the savour of roast, perfectly normal beast flesh. There was also the geometry of the slice to be refined, the precise relationships between the width and height of the slice, and also its thickness, which could would give the proper sense of bulk and weight to the finished sandwich. Here again lightness was a virtue but so too were firmness, generosity, and that promise of succulence and savour that is the hallmark of a truly intense sandwich experience. 
The proper tools, of course, were crucial, and many were the days that the sandwich maker, when not engaged with the baker at his oven, would spend with Strinder the toolmaker, weighing and balancing knives, taking them to the forge and back again. Suppleness, strength, keenness of edge, length and balance were all enthusiastically debated. Theories were put forward, tested, refined, and many was the evening when the sandwich-maker and the tool-maker could be seen silhouetted against the light of the setting sun, and the tool-maker's forge making slow, sweeping movements through the air, trying one knife after another, comparing the weight of this one and the balance of another, the suppleness of a third, and the handle-binding to a fourth. Three knives altogether were required. First, there was the knife for the slicing of the bread, a firm, authoritative blade which imposed a clear and defining will on a loaf. Then there was the butter-spreading knife, which was a whippy little number, but still with a firm backbone to it. Early versions had been a little too whippy, but now the combination of flexibility with a core of strength was exactly right to achieve the maximum smoothness and grace of spread. Chief among the knives, of course, was the carving knife. This was the knife that would not merely impose its will on the medium through which it moved, as did the bread knife, it must work with it, be guided by the grain of the meat, to achieve slices of the most exquisite consistency and translucency that would slide away in filmy folds from the main hunk of meat. The sandwich maker would then flip each sheet with a smooth flick of the wrist onto the beautifully proportioned lower bread slice trim it with four deft strokes, and then, at last, perform the magic that the children of the village so longed to gather round and watch with rapt attention and wonder. With just four more dexterous flips of the knife, he would assemble the trimmings into a perfectly fitting jigsaw of pieces on top of the primary slice. For every sandwich the size and shape of the trimmings were different, but the sandwich maker would always effortlessly and without hesitation assemble them into a pattern which fitted perfectly. A second layer of meat and a second layer of trimmings, and the main act of creation would be accomplished. The sandwich maker would pass what he had made to his assistant, who would then add a few slices of newcomer and fladdish and a touch of splagberry sauce, and then apply the topmost layer of bread and cut the sandwich with a fourth and altogether plainer knife. It was not that these were not also skilful operations, but they were lesser skills to be performed by a dedicated apprentice who would, one day, when the sandwich maker finally laid down his tools, take over from him. It was an exalted position, and that apprentice, Drimple, was the envy of all his fellows. There were those in the village who were happy chopping wood, those who were content carrying water, but to be the sandwich maker was very heaven. And so the sandwich maker sang as he worked. He was using the last of the year's salted meat. It was a little past its best now, but still the rich savour of perfectly normal beast meat was something unsurpassed in any of the sandwich maker's previous experience. Next week it was anticipated that the perfectly normal beasts would appear again for their regular migration, whereupon the whole village would once again be plunged into frenetic action, hunting the beasts, killing perhaps six, and maybe even seven dozen of the thousands that thundered past. Then the beasts must be rapidly butchered and cleaned, and with most of the meat salted to keep it through the winter months until the return migration in the spring, that would be when they would replenish their supplies. The very best of the meat would be roasted straight away for the feast that marked the autumn passage. 
The celebrations would last for three days of sheer exuberance, dancing and stories that old Thrashbarg would tell of how the hunt had gone, stories that he would have been busy sitting making up in his hut whilst the rest of the village was actually out doing the hunting. And then the very, very best of the meat would be saved from the feast and delivered cold to the sandwich maker and the sandwich-maker would exercise on it the skills that he had brought to them from the gods, and make the exquisite sandwiches of the third season, of which the whole village would partake before beginning the next day to prepare themselves for the rigours of the coming winter. Today he was just making ordinary sandwiches. If such delicacies, so lovingly crafted, could ever be called ordinary. Today his assistant was away, so the sandwich-maker was applying his own garnish, which he was happy to do. He was happy with just about everything, in fact. He sliced. He sang. He flipped each piece of meat neatly onto a slice of bread, trimmed it and assembled all the trimmings into their jigsaw. A little salad, a little sauce, another slice of bread, another sandwich, another verse of yellow submarine. Hello, Arthur! The sandwich maker almost sliced his thumb off. The villagers had watched in consternation as the woman had marched boldly to the hut of the sandwich maker. The sandwich maker had been sent to them by Almighty Bob in a burning, fiery chariot. This, at least, was what Thrashbarg had said, and Thrashbarg was the authority on these things. So, at least, Thrashbarg claimed, and Thrashbarg was, and so on and so on. It was hardly worth arguing about. A few villagers wondered why Almighty Bob would send his onely begotten sandwich-maker in a burning, fiery chariot, rather than perhaps in one that might have landed quietly and without destroying half the forest, filling it with ghosts, and also injuring the sandwich-maker quite badly. Old Thrashbarg said that it was the ineffable will of Bob, and when they asked him what ineffable meant, he said, look it up. This was a problem because old Thrashbarg had the only dictionary, and he would not let them borrow it. They asked him why not, and he said that it was not for them to know the will of Almighty Bob, and when they asked him why not again, he said because he said so. Anyway, somebody sneaked into old Thrashbarg's hut one day whilst he was out having a swim, and looked up ineffable. Ineffable apparently meant unknowable, indescribable, unutterable, not to be known or spoken about. So that cleared that up. At least they'd got the sandwiches. One day, old Thrashbarg said that Almighty Bob had decreed that he, Thrashbarg, was to have first pick of the sandwiches. The villagers asked him when this had happened exactly, and Thrashbarg said that it had happened yesterday, when they weren't looking. Have faith, old Thrashbarg said or burn. They let him have first pick of the sandwiches. It seemed easiest. And now this woman, this woman had just arrived out of nowhere and gone straight for the sandwich maker's hut. His fame had obviously spread, though it was hard to know where to since, according to old Thrashbarg, there wasn't anywhere else. Anyway, wherever it was she had come from, presumably somewhere ineffable, she was now here and was in the sandwich-maker's hut. Who was she? And who was the strange girl who was hanging around outside the hut moodily and kicking at stones and showing every sign of not wanting to be there? It seemed odd that someone should come all the way from somewhere ineffable in a chariot that was obviously a vast improvement on the burning fiery one which had bought them the sandwich maker if she didn't even want to be here. They all looked to Thrashbarg, but he was on his knees mumbling and looking very firmly up into the sky and not catching anybody else's eye until he'd thought of something. Trillion! said the sandwich-maker, sucking his bleeding thumb. What? Who? 
when where exactly the questions i was going to ask you said trillian looking around arthur's hut it was neatly laid out with his kitchen utensils there were some fairly basic cupboards and shelves and a basic bed in the corner a door at the back of the room led to something trillian couldn't quite see because the door was closed nice she said but in an inquiring tone of voice she couldn't quite make out what the setup was. Very nice, said Arthur. Wonderfully nice. I don't know when I've ever been anywhere nicer. I'm happy here. They like me. I make sandwiches for them. And, well, that's about it, really. They like me, and I make sandwiches for them. Sounds, er, uh, idyllic, said Far Arthur firmly. It is. It really is. I don't expect you'd like it very much, but for me it's, well, it's perfect. Look, sit down, please. Make yourself comfortable. Can I get you anything? Uh, a sandwich? Trillian picked up a sandwich and looked at it. She sniffed it carefully. Try it, said Arthur. It's good. Trillian took a nibble, then a bite and munched on it thoughtfully. "'It is good,' she said, looking at it. "'My life's work,' said Arthur, trying to sound proud, and hoping he didn't sound like a complete idiot. He was used to being revered a bit, and was having to go through some unexpected mental gear changes. "'What's, what's the meat in it?' "'Ah, yes, that's, um, that's perfectly normal beast.' "'It's what?' perfectly normal beast. It's a bit like a cow, or rather a, a bull, well, kind of like a buffalo, in fact, large, charging sort of animal. So, what's odd about it? Nothing. It's perfectly normal. I see. It's just a bit odd where it comes from. Trillian frowned and stopped chewing. "'Where does it come from?' she asked with her mouth full. She wasn't going to swallow until she knew. "'Well, it's not just a matter of where it comes from. It's also where it goes to. It's all right. It's perfectly safe to swallow. I've eaten tons of it. It's great, very succulent, very tender, slightly sweet flavour with a long, dark finish.' Trillian still hadn't swallowed. "'Where,' she said, "'does it come from, and where does it go to?' "'They come from a point just slightly to the east of the Hondo Mountains. "'They're the big ones behind us here. "'You must have seen them as you came in. Uh, "'Then they sweep in their thousands across the great Anhondo Plains, "'and, well, that's it, really. "'That's where they come from, and where they go to.' Trillian frowned. There was something she wasn't quite getting about this. "'Oh, I probably haven't made it clear,' said Arthur. "'When I say they come from a point to the east of the Hondo Mountains, I mean that's where they suddenly appear. Then they sweep across the Anhondo Plains and, well, vanish, really. We have about six days to catch as many of them as we can before they disappear.' In the spring, they do it again, only the other way round, you see. Reluctantly, Trillian swallowed. It was either that or spit it out, and it did, in fact, taste really pretty good. I see, she said, once she had reassured herself that it didn't seem to be, she, that she didn't seem to be suffering any ill effects. And why are they called perfectly normal beasts? Well, I think because otherwise people might think it was a bit odd. I think old Thrashbard called them that. He says that they come from where they come from, and they go to where they go to, and that's Bob's will, and that's all there is to it. Who just don't even ask? Well, you look well on it. I feel well. And you look well. I'm well. I'm, I'm very well. Well, that's good. Yes. Good. Good. Nice of you to drop in. Thanks. Well, 
said Arthur, casting around himself, astounding how hard it was to think of anything to say to someone after all this time. I, um, I expect you're wondering how I found you, said Trillian. Yes, said Arthur, I was wondering exactly that. How did you find me? Well, as you may or may not know, I now work for one of the big sub-ether broadcasting networks that... I did know that, said Arthur, suddenly remembering. Yes, you've done very well. That's terrific. Very exciting. Well done. It must be a lot of fun. Exhausting. All that rushing around. Yeah, I expect it must be, yeah. We have access to virtually every kind of information. I found your name on the passenger list of the ship that crashed. Arthur was astonished. You mean they knew about the crash? Well, of course they knew. They, you don't have whole space liners disappear without someone knowing about it. But you mean they knew where it had happened? They, they knew I'd survived? Yes. But nobody's ever been to look or search or rescue. There's, there's been absolutely nothing. Well, well there wouldn't be. It's a complicated insurance thing. They just bury the whole thing. Pretend it never happened. The insurance business is completely screwy now. You know they've reintroduced the death penalty for insurance company directors. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> really? said Arthur. No, no, I didn't. For what offence? Trillian frowned. What do you mean, offence? Ah, I see. Trillian gave Arthur a long look, and then, in a new tone of voice, said, "'It's time for you to take responsibility, Arthur.' Arthur tried to understand this remark. He found it often took a moment or two before he saw exactly what it was that people were driving at, so he let a moment or two pass at a leisurely rate. Life was so pleasant and relaxed these days, there was time to let things sink in. He let it sink in. No, he still didn't quite understand what she meant, though, so in the end he had to say so. Trillian gave him a cool smile and then turned back to the door of the hut. Random, she called. Come in. Come and meet your father. Oh, my God. Quick slurp of tea. Ah, lovely. As the guide folded itself back into a smooth, dark disc, Ford realised some pretty hectic stuff. Or at least he tried to realise it, but it was too hectic to take in in one go. His head was hammering, his ankle was hurting, and though he didn't like to be a wimp about his ankle, he always found that intense multidimensional logic was something he best understood in the bath. He needed time to think about this. Time, a tall drink, and some kind of rich, foamy oil. He had to get out of here. He had to get the guide out of here. He didn't think they'd make it together. He glanced wildly around the room. Think, 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 think. It had to be something simple and obvious. If he was right in his nasty lurking suspicion that he was dealing with nasty lurking Vogons, then the more simple and obvious the better. Suddenly he saw what he needed. He wouldn't try to beat the system, he would just use it. The frightening thing about the Vogons was their absolute mindless determination to do whatever mindless thing it was they were determined to do. There was never any point in trying to appeal to their reason, because they didn't have any. However, if you kept your nerve, you could sometimes exploit their blinkered, bludgeoning insistence on being bludgeoning and blinkered. It wasn't merely that their left hand didn't always know what their right hand was doing, so to speak, quite often their right hand had a pretty hazy notion as well. Did he dare just post the thing to himself? 
Did he dare just put it in the system and let the Vogons work out how to get the thing to him, while at the same time they were busy, they would probably be tearing the building apart, finding out where he'd hidden it? Yes! Feverishly, he packed it. He wrapped it. He labelled it. With a moment's pause to wonder if he really was doing the right thing, he committed the package to the building's internal mail chute. Colin, he said, turning to the little hovering ball, I am going to abandon you to your fate. I'm so happy, said Colin. Make the most of it, said Ford, because what I want you to do is to nursemaid that package out of the building. They'll probably incinerate you when they find you, and I won't be here to help. It will be very, very nasty for you, and that's just too bad. Got it? I gurgle with pleasure, said Colin. Go, said Ford. Colin obediently dived down the mail chute in pursuit of his charge. Now Ford had only himself to worry about, but that was still quite a substantial worry. There were noises of heavy running footsteps outside the door, which he had taken the precaution of locking and shifting a large filing cabinet in front of. He was worried that everything had gone so smoothly. Everything had fitted terribly well. He'd hurtled through the day with reckless abandon, and yet everything had worked out with uncanny neatness. Except for his shoe. He was bitter about his shoe. That was an account that would have to be settled. With a deafening roar, the door exploded inwards. In the turmoil of smoke and dust, he could see large, slug-like creatures hurrying through. So, everything was going well, was it? Everything was working out as if the most extraordinarily luck was on his side. Well, he'd see about that. In a spirit of inquiry, he hurled himself out of the window again. The first month, getting to know each other, was a little difficult. The second month, trying to come to terms with what they got to know about each other in the first month, was much easier. The third month, when the box arrived, was very tricky indeed. At the beginning, it was a problem even trying to explain what a month was. This had been a pleasantly simple matter for Arthur here on Lamuella. The days were just a little over 25 hours long, which basically meant an extra hour in bed every single day. And of course, having regularly to reset his watch which Arthur rather enjoyed doing. He also felt at home with the number of suns and moons which Lamuella had, one of each, as opposed to some of the planets he'd fetched up on from time to time, which had had ridiculous numbers of them. The planet orbited its single sun every 300 days, which was a good number because it meant the year didn't drag. The moon orbited Lamuella just over nine times a year, which meant that a month was a little over 30 days, which was absolutely perfect because it gave you a little more time to get things done in. It was not merely reassuringly like Earth. It was actually rather an improvement. Random, on the other hand, thought she was trapped in a recurring nightmare. She would have crying fits and think that the moon was out to get her. Every night it was there, and then when it went, the sun came out and followed her over and over again. Trillian had warned Arthur that Random might have some difficulty in adjusting to a more regular lifestyle than she'd been used to up to now. But Arthur hadn't actually been ready for actual howling at the moon. He hadn't been ready for any of this, of course. His daughter. His daughter. He and Trillian, they, they'd never, they'd never, had they? He was absolutely convinced he would have remembered. What about Zaphod? Not the same species, Arthur, Trillian had answered. When I decided I wanted a child, they ran all sorts of genetic tests on me and could only find one match anywhere. 
was only later that it dawned on me. I double-checked, and I was right. They don't usually like to tell you, but I insisted. You, you mean you went to a DNA bank? Arthur had asked Pop-Eyed. Yes, but she wasn't quite as random as her name suggests, because, of course, you were the only Homo sapiens donor. I must say, though, it seems you were quite a frequent flyer. Arthur had stared wide-eyed at the unhappy-looking girl who was slouching awkwardly in the doorframe, looking at him. But when? How long? You mean what age is she? Y yes. The wrong one. What do you mean? I mean that I haven't any idea. What? Well, in my timeline, I think it's about ten years since I had her, but she's obviously quite a lot older than that. I spend my life going backwards and forwards in time, you see. The job, I used to take her with me when I could, but uh, now it's just, just not wasn't always possible. Then I used to put her in daycare time zones, but you just can't get reliable time tracking now. You leave them there in the morning, and you've simply no idea how old they'll be in the evening. You complain until you're blue in the face, but it doesn't get you anywhere. I left her at one of the places for a few hours once, and when I came back she'd passed puberty. I've done all I can, Arthur. It's over to you. I've got a war to cover. The ten seconds that passed after Trillian left were about the longest of Arthur Dent's life. Time, we know, is relative. You can travel light years through the stars and back, and if you do it at the speed of light, then when you return you may have aged mere seconds, whilst your twin brother or sister will have aged twenty, thirty, forty, or however many years it is, depending on how far you travelled. This will come to you as a profound personal shock, particularly if you didn't know you had a twin brother or sister. The seconds that you have been absent for will not have been sufficient time for you to, pe to prepare for the shock of new and strangely distended family relationships when you return. Ten seconds silence was not enough time for Arthur to reassemble his whole view of himself and his life in a way that suddenly included an entire new daughter, of whose merest existence he had not had the slightest, slightest inkling of a suspicion when he'd woken that morning. Deep, emotional family ties cannot be constructed in ten seconds, however far and fast you travel away from them, and Arthur could only feel helpless, bewildered and numb as he looked at the girl standing in his doorway, staring at his floor. He supposed that there was no point in pretending not to be hopeless. He walked over, and he hugged her. "'I don't love you,' he said. I "'I'm sorry. I don't even know you yet. But give me a few minutes.' "'We live in strange times.' We also live in strange places, each in a universe of our own. The people with whom we populate our universes are the shadows of whole other universes intersecting with our own. Being able to glance out into this bewildering complexity of infinite recursion and saying things like, Oh, hi Ed, nice tan, how's Carol? involves a great deal of filtering skill for which all conscious entities have eventually to develop a capacity in order to protect themselves from the contemplation of the chaos through which they seethe and tumble. So, give your kid a break, OK? An extract from Practical Parenting in a Fractally Demented Universe. What's this? Arthur had almost given up. That is to say, he was not going to give up. He was absolutely not going to give up. Not now, not ever. But if he had been the sort of person who was going to give up, this was probably the time he would have done it. Not content with being surly, bad-tempered, wanting to go and play in the Paleozoic era, not seeing why they had to do have to have the gravity on the whole time, and shouting at the sun to stop following her, Random had also used his carving knife to dig up stones to throw at the picker birds for looking at her like that. Arthur didn't even know if Lamuella had had a Paleozoic era. 
According to old Thrashbarg, the planet had been found fully formed in the navel of a giant earwig at 4.31 Vrunde afternoon, and although Arthur, as a seasoned galactic traveller with good O-level passes in physics and geography, had a fairly serious doubts about this, it was rather a waste of try- time trying to argue with old Thrashbarg, and there had never been much point before. He sighed as he sat nursing the chipped and bent knife. He was going to love her if it killed him, or her, or both. It wasn't easy being a father. He knew that no one had ever said it was going to be easy, but that wasn't the point, because he'd never asked about being one in the first place. He was doing his best. Every moment that he could rest away from making sandwiches, he was spending with her, talking to her, walking with her, sitting on the hill with her, watching the sun go down over the valley in which the the village nestled, trying to find out about her life, trying to explain to her about his. It was a tricky business. The common ground between them, apart from the fact that they had almost identical genes, was about the size of a pebble. Or rather, it was about the size of Trillian, and of her, they had slightly differing views. What's this? He suddenly realised that she'd been talking to him and he hadn't noticed, or rather, he hadn't recognised her voice. Instead of the usual tone of her voice in which she spoke to him, which was bitter and truculent, she was just asking him a simple question. He looked round in surprise. She was sitting there on a stool in the corner of the hut in that rather hunched way she had, knees together, feet splayed out, with her dark hair hanging down over her face as she looked at something she'd cradled in her hands. Arthur went over to her, a little nervously. Her mood swings were very unpredictable, but so far they'd all been between different types of bad ones. Outbreaks of bitter recrimination would give way without warning to abject self-pity, and then long bouts of sullen despair, which were punctuated with sudden acts of mindless violence against inanimate objects and demands to go to electric clubs. Not only were there no electric clubs on Lamuella, there were no clubs at all, and, in fact, no electricity. There was a forge and a bakery, a few carts and a well. But those were the high watermark of Lamuelan technology, and a fair number of Random's unquenchable rages were directed against the sheer incomprehensible backwardness of the place. She would pick up sub-ether on a small flexor panel which had been surgically implanted in her wrist, but that didn't cheer her up at all because it was full of news of insanely exciting things happening in every other part of the galaxy than here. (coughs) <coughs> Pardon me. It would also give her frequent news of her mother, who dumped her to go off and cover some war which now seemed not to have happened, or at least to have gone all wrong in some way because of the absence of any proper intelligence gathering. It also gave her access to lots of great adventure shows, featuring all sorts of fantastically expensive spaceships crashing into each other. The villagers were absolutely hypnotised by all these wonderful magic images flashing over her wrist. They'd only ever seen one spaceship crash, and it had been so frightening, violent and shocking, and of course so much horrible devastation, fire and death, that stupidly they had never realised it was entertainment. Old Thrashbark had been so astonished by it that he had instantly seen Random as an emissary from Bob, but had fairly soon afterwards decided that in fact she had been sent as a test of his faith, if not of his patience. He was also alarmed at the number of spaceship crashes he had to start incorporating into his holy stories if he was going to hold the attention of the villagers, and not have them rushing off to peer at Random's wrist all the time. At the moment, she was not peering at her wrist. Her wrist was turned off. (coughs) Arthur squatted down quietly beside her to see what she was looking at. It was his watch. He'd taken it off when he'd gone to shower under the local waterfall and Random had found it and was trying to work it out. "'Oh, it's just a watch,' he said. "'It's to tell the time.' "'I know that,' she said. "'But you keep fiddling with it and it doesn't seem to tell the right time or, or anything like it.' She brought up the display on her wrist panel, which automatically produced a readout of local time. 
her wrist panel had quietly got on with the business of measuring the local gravity and orbital momentum and noticed where the sun was and tracked its movement in the sky, all within the first few minutes of Random's arrival. It had then quickly picked up clues from its environment as to what the local unit conventions were and reset itself appropriately. It did this sort of thing continually, which was particularly valuable if you did a lot of travelling in time as well as space. Random frowned at her father's watch. It didn't do any of this. Arthur was very fond of it. It was better, a better one than he would have ever afforded himself. He had been given it on his twenty-second birthday by a rich and guilt-ridden godfather who had up to that point forgotten every single birthday he'd had, and also his name. It had the day, the date, the phases of the moon. It had to Albert on his twenty-first birthday, and the wrong date engraved on the battered and scratched surface on its back, of its back in letters that were still just about visible. That watch had been through a considerable amount of stuff in the last few years, most of which would fall well outside the warranty. He didn't suppose, of course, that the warranty had especially mentioned that the watch was guaranteed to be accurate only within the very particular gravitational and ma magnetic fields of the Earth. And so long as the day was 24 hours long, and the planet didn't explode, and so on. These were such basic assumptions that even the lawyers would have missed them. Luckily, his watch was a wind-up one, or at least a self-winder. Nowhere in the, else in the galaxy would he have found batteries of precisely the dimensions and power specifications that were perfectly standard on Earth. So, what are all these numbers? asked Random. Arthur took it from her. Well, these numbers round the edge mark the hours. In the little window on the right it says th which means Thursday, and the number is 14, which means it's the 14th day of the month of May, which is what it says in this window over here. And this sort of crescent-shaped window at the top tells you about the phases of the moon. In other words, it tells you how much of the moon is lit up by, at night by the sun, which depends on the relative positions of the sun and the moon and, well, the Earth. The Earth, said Random, yes. And that's where you came from, and where Mum came from. Yeah. Random took the watch back from him and looked at it again, clearly baffled by something. And she held it up to her ear and listened in puzzlement. What's that noise? It's ticking. It's the mechanism that drives the watch. It's called clockwork. It's all kind of interlocking cogs and springs that work to turn the hands round at exactly the right speed to mark the hours and minutes and days and so on. Random carried on peering at it. There's something puzzling you, said Arthur. What is it? Yes, said Random at last. Why is it all in hardware? <coughs> Better cough, uh, bit of tea. I've got a frog in me throat. Oh, God. <clears throat> Arthur suggested that they went for a walk. He felt that there were things that they should discuss, and for once Random seemed, if not precisely amenable and willing, then at least not growling. From Random's point of view, this was all also very weird. It wasn't that she wanted to be difficult as such, it was just that she didn't know how or what else to be. Who was this guy? What was this life she was supposed to lead? What was this world she was supposed to lead it in? And, and what was this universe that kept coming at her through her eyes and ears? What was it for? What did he want? She'd been born on a spaceship that had been going from somewhere to somewhere else. And when it had got to somewhere else, somewhere else had only turned out to be another somewhere that you had to get to, get to somewhere else again from, and so on. It was her normal expectation that she wasn't supposed to be somewhere else. Sorry, it was her normal expectation that she was supposed to be somewhere else. It was normal for her to feel that she was in the wrong place. Then, constant time travel had only compounded this problem. It had led to the feeling that she was not only always in the wrong place, but she was also almost there at always the wrong time. 
she didn't notice that she felt this because it was the only way she ever felt. Just as it never seemed odd to her that nearly everywhere that she went, she either needed to wear weights or anti-gravity suits, and usually special apparatus for breathing as well. The only places you could ever feel right where worlds were, <clears throat> were worlds you designed for yourself to inhabit, virtual realities in the electric clubs. It had never occurred to her that the real universe was something that you could actually fit into. And that included this Lamuella place her mother had dumped her in, and it also included this person who had bestowed her uh, on her this precious and magical gift of life in return for a seat upgrade. It was just as well that he had turned out to be rather kind and friendly, or there would have been trouble. Really, she had got a specially sharpened stone in her pocket she could cause a lot of trouble with. It can be very dangerous to see things from somebody else's, somebody else's point of view without the proper training. They sat on the spot that Arthur particularly liked, on the side of a hill overlooking the valley. The sun was going down over the village. The only thing that Arthur wasn't quite so fond of was being able to see a little way into the next valley, where a deep, dark, mangled furrow in the forest marked the spot where his ship had crashed. But maybe that was what kept bringing him back here. There were plenty of spots from which you could survey the lush rolling countryside of Lamuella, but this was the only one he was drawn to with its nagging dark spot of fear and pain nestling just on the edge of his vision. He'd never been there again since he'd been pulled out of the wreckage. Wouldn't. Couldn't bear it. In fact, he'd gone some of the way back to it the very next day, whilst he was still numb and spinning with shock. He had a broken leg, a couple of broken ribs, some bad burns, and was not really thinking coherently, but had insisted that the villagers take him, which, uneasily, they had. He had not managed to get right to the actual spot where the ground had bubbled and melted, however, and at last hobbled away from the horror forever. Soon, word got around that the whole area was haunted, and no one had ventured back there ever since. The land was full of beautiful, verdant and delightful valleys. No point going into a highly worrying one. Let the past hold on to itself, and let the present move forward into the future. Random cradled the watch in her hands, slowly turning it to let the long light of the evening sun shine warmly in the scratches and scuffs of the thick glass. It fascinated her watching the spidery little second hand ticking its way round. Every time it completed a full circle, the longer of the two main hands had moved on exactly to the next of the small sixty divisions around the dial, and when the long hand had made its own full circle, the smaller hand had moved on to the next of the main digits. "'You've been watching it for over an hour,' said Arthur quietly. "'I know,' she said. "'An hour is when the big hand has gone all the way round, yes?' "'That's right.' Then I've been watching it for an hour and seventeen minutes. She smiled with a deep and mysterious pleasure, and moved very slightly so that she was resting just a little against his arm. Arthur felt a small sigh escape from him that had been pent up inside his chest for weeks. He wanted to put his arm around his daughter's shoulders, but felt it was too early yet and that she would shy away from him. But something was working. Something was easing inside her. The watch meant something to her that nothing in her life had so far managed to do. Arthur was not sure that he had really understood what it was yet, but he was profoundly pleased and relieved that something had touched her. Explain to me again, said Random. Really, nothing to it, said Arthur. Clockwork was something that developed over hundreds of years. Earth years. Yes, it became finer and finer and more and more intricate. It was highly skilled and delicate work. It had to be made very small, and it had to carry on working accurately, however much you waved it around or dropped it. But only on one planet. 
Well, yes, that's where it was made, you see. It was never expected to go anywhere else and deal with different suns and moons and magnetic fields and things. I mean, the thing still goes perfectly well, but it just doesn't really mean much this far from Switzerland. From where? Switzerland. That's where these were made. Small, hilly country. Tiresomely neat. The people who made them really didn't know that there were other worlds. It's quite a big thing not to know. Well... Yes. So where did they come from? They, that is we, just sort of grew there. We evolved on the earth from, I don't know, some kind of sludge or something. Like this watch. Um, no, I don't think the watch grew out of sludge. You don't understand! Random suddenly leapt to her feet, shouting, You don't understand! You don't understand me! You don't understand anything! I hate you for being so stupid! She started to run hectically down the hill, still clutching the watch and shouting that she hated him. Arthur jumped up, startled and at a loss. He started to run after her through the stringy and clumpy grass. It was hard and painful for him. When he'd broken his leg in the crash, it had not been a clean break, and it had not healed cleanly. He was stumbling and wincing as he ran. Suddenly she turned and faced him, her face dark with anger. She brandished the watch at him. You don't understand that there's somewhere this belongs, somewhere it works, somewhere it fits. She turned and ran again. She was fit and fleet-footed, and Arthur could not remotely hope to keep up with her. It wasn't that he not he. It wasn't that he had not expected being a father to be this difficult. It was that he hadn't expected to be a father at all, particularly not suddenly and unexpectedly, on an alien planet. Random turned to shout at him again. For some reason, he stopped each time she did. "'Who do you think I am?' she demanded angrily. "'Your upgrade? Who do you think Mum thought I was? "'Some sort of ticket to the life she didn't have?' I, I, "'I don't know what you mean by that,' said Arthur, panting and hurting. "'You don't know what anybody means by anything.' "'What do you mean? Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! "'Tell me, please, tell me. "'What does she mean by saying the life she didn't have?' She wished she'd stayed on Earth. She wished she hadn't gone off with that stupid, brain-dead fruit gum, Zaphod. She thinks she would have had a different life. But, said Arthur, she, she would have been killed. She would have been killed when the world was destroyed. That's a different life, isn't it? That's... Well, she wouldn't have had to have me. She hates me. You can't mean that. How can anyone possibly... Uh, I, I mean, she had me because I was meant to make things fit for her. That was my job. But I fitted even worse than she did. So she just shut me off and carried on with her stupid life. What's stupid about her life? She's fantastically successful, isn't she? She's all over time and space, all over sub-ether TV networks. Stupid! 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 Random turned and ran off again. Arthur couldn't keep up with her, and at last he had to sit down for a bit and let the pain in his legs subside. The turmoil on his head he didn't know what to do with at all. He hobbled into the village an hour later. It was getting dark. The villagers he passed said hello, but there was a sense of nervousness and of not quite knowing what was going on or what to do about it in the air. Old Thrashbarg had been seen pulling on his beard a fair bit and looking at the moon, and that was not a good sign either. Arthur went into his hut. Random was sitting hunched quietly over the table. "'I'm sorry,' she said. "'I'm so sorry.' "'That's all right,' said Arthur, as gently as he knew how. "'It's good to, well, to have a little chat. "'There's so much we have to learn and understand about each other, "'and life isn't, well, it isn't all just tea and sandwiches.' "'I'm so sorry,' she said again, sobbing. "'Arthur went up to her and put his arm around her shoulder. 
She didn't resist or pull away. Then Arthur saw what it was she was so sorry about. In the pool of light thrown by a Lamuelan lantern lay Arthur's watch. Random had forced the back off it with the back edge of the butter-spreading knife, and all of the minute cogs and springs and levers were lying in a tiny cockeyed mess where she'd been fiddling with them. I, I, I just wanted to see how it all worked, said Random, how it all fitted together. I'm so sorry. I can't get it back together. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. I'll get it repaired. Really, I'll get it repaired. The following day, Thrashbarg came round and said all sorts of bob stuff. He tried to exert a calming influence by inviting Random to let her mind dwell on the ineffable mystery of the giant earwig, and Random said there was no giant earwig, and Thrashbarg went very cold and silent, and said that she would be cast into the outer darkness. Random said, good. She'd been born there. And the next day, the parcel arrived. This was all getting a bit eventful. In fact, when the parcel arrived, delivered by a kind of robot drone that dropped out of the sky making droning robot noses, noises, noses, noises, it brought with it a sense which gradually began to permeate through the whole village that it was almost one event too many. It wasn't the robot drone's fault. All it required was Arthur Dent's signature or thumbprint or just a few scrapings of skin cells from the nape of his neck, and it would be on its way again. It hung around, waiting, not quite sure what all of this resentment was about. Meanwhile, Kerp had caught another fish with a head at both ends. But on closer inspection, it turned out that it was, in fact, two fish cut in half and sewn together rather badly. So not only had Kerp failed to rekindle any great interest in two-headed fish, but he had seriously cast doubt on the authenticity of the first one. Only the picker birds seemed to feel that everything was exactly normal. The robot drone got Arthur's signature and made its escape. Arthur bore the parcel back to his hut and sat and looked at it. Let's open it! said Random, who was feeling much more cheerful this morning now that everything around her got thoroughly weird. But Arthur said no. Why not? It's not addressed to me. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's addressed to, well, it's addressed to Ford Prefect in care of me. Ford Prefect? Is he the one who... Yes, said Arthur tartly. I've heard about him. I expect you have. Let's open it anyway. What else are we going to do? I don't know, said Arthur, who really wasn't sure. He'd taken his damaged knives over to the forge bright and early that morning, and Strinder had had a good look at them and said that he would see what he could do. They had tried the usual business of waving the knives through the air, feeling for the point of balance and the point of flex and so on, but the joy was gone from it and Arthur had a sad feeling that his sandwich-making days were probably numbered. He hung his head. The next appearance of the perfectly normal beasts was imminent, but Arthur felt that the usual festivities of hunting and feasting were going to be rather muted and uncertain. Something had happened here on Lamuella, and Arthur had a horrible feeling that it was him. "'What do you think it is?' urged Random, turning the parcel over in her hands. "'I don't know,' said Arthur. "'Something bad and worrying, though.' "'How do you know?' Random protested. "'Because anything to do with Ford Prefect is bound to be worse and more worrying than something that isn't,' said Arthur. "'Believe me.' "'You're upset about something, aren't you?' said Random. Arthur sighed. "'I'm just... I'm just feeling a little jumpy and unsettled, I think,' said Arthur. "'I'm sorry,' said Random, and put the package down again. 
She could see that it really would upset him if she opened it. She would just have to do it when he wasn't looking. And at seven minutes past ten, that is where we will leave it for this evening. Thank you all for joining, as usual. Um, I will get these. I've got, I've got two, three now, three episodes that need to be uh, put out onto the podcast. So I'm going to tidy those up tomorrow and uh, Tuesday and get them out there. Um, but as I said earlier, if you haven't already done so, please become a patron. Go to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit. And for five dollars a month, sign up and support me and get in, uh, exclusive content and all sorts of other stuff. But please do do that. Please, please, please. Patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit. Um, I will be here the same time next week, as I hope you will. I hope you have fantastic weeks that you look after yourself. You don't do anything silly, uh, uh, and you're just basically hoopy and fruity all week. Uh, and uh, see you in a week's time. Thank you ever so much, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.